Great to welcome everybody for joining us today. And thank you so much for joining us. Specifically, thanks very much to Dr. Southwick because I only just asked him early or late last week if he can give us the evidence-based update on the Omicron variant. And then must have worked on it pretty much all weekend to be able to give it today. So that's really sweet, very nice. We're really lucky. We have to be so grateful to have this kind of expertise in our group because frankly, it's a lot to keep up on with the literature and to make sure you're getting the accurate literature. So with that, I'm gonna mute, turn it to Dr. Southwick. Feel free to put questions in the chat and or unmute where applicable. Thanks, Dr. Southwick. Great, thanks, Neela. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk to everybody and, and it's, you know, the, the information is coming fast and furious and it's really hard to keep up with. And if, if there's something that you know that I haven't included, please let me know because uh, it's almost impossible right now to keep up with all this. But uh, the, uh, first of all, where did the Omicron variant originate? And I think most of you know, it was actually in this one province, uh, the, the Gao, Gao Seng province in South Africa, it looks like Gao Teng province, where it looks like it, where it was first reported. Um, it probably was in other areas, but uh, they didn't, uh, the good news about South Africa is they have a very good surveillance system Then they're doing genomic sequencing. And that's how I think how they found it so quickly and reported it. And then the world was very nice to them. They decided to block everybody traveling there and destroyed their tourist uh, industry because they were responsible and reported. Not the ideal way to do this, unfortunately. Uh, that's sort of, they backed off that now because um, it's uh, worldwide. But looking at, at their curves uh, early on, you can see they had, uh, they have had, South Africa's had, uh, this is the number of cases and this is uh, the horizontal axis is months. And you can see after the original um, wild type variant, they had one peak, then they had the beta uh, uh, variant, and then they had the Delta variant, and then the Omicron variant. And what you can see is the dramatic, sharp rise with no lag phase whatsoever, indicating that this variant was far more infectious, and the doubling time was 1.5 to 3 days, the fastest of any variant that had been described up to that point. And it uh, quickly became uh, tra locally transmitted in multiple areas of the country within a very short period of time. It was actually re first reported November 24th. And as of December 20th, you can see that it has spread uh, throughout most of the world. And, and certainly in the United States, person to person, South America, India, uh, all of Europe, uh, as well as Australia. And in the U.S., uh, what happened is the, the CDC followed the percent Omicron in week one after the reporting it was only 0.4 percent. Uh, but then two by week two, it was three percent. And by week three, it was 70 percent. They subsequently backed off that and said that was a little high. But we know right now, certainly in the state of Florida, I think most areas, it represents 95 percent of the new cases. So this uh, this variant became dominant very, very quickly. And here is, uh, this is a curve of Florida, uh, December 30th, and you can see the same identical sharp exponential curve with a doubling time of two to three days. So uh, what, what happened uh, with the virus? What are the variations that caused this uh, more rapid spread, this more highly contagious variant? Well, as you recall, um, first of all, the, the, the spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptors is then, and then it's quickly internalized after it cleaves at the furin site. Uh, that causes a conformational change of the spike protein and it quickly is internalized. And then there's a replicase that produces actually the viral proteins. And also there is, uh, or it increases the number amount of RNA and, a, and also a transcriptase that produces the viral proteins. So the RNA is replicated it forms a nuclear capsid. The various proteins are replicated in the endoplasmic reticulum, and then they coat the outer side, outer uh, wall around the nuclear capsid. It ends up in vesicles and then is released. And the original variant, uh, the actual process from beginning to entry to uh, release of, of virion, new virions, was 10 hours. 
and were on average a hundred. There were hundred viral particles per cell. However, uh, with the Delta variant, um, particularly which was the last variant, which only had nine mutations, there were two key mutations: the T478K and the P681R, and the T478K made uh, created um, higher affinity, tighter binding to the ACE2 receptor, and the P681R actually affected the uh, furin, made it easier for furin to cleave the site so it entered more quickly. And it was it had a 60% uh, greater efficiency to spread compared to the alpha uh, variant, uh, which was about 50% higher than the original uh, strain and had a reproductive rate of five to six with a high of nine. Um, so the Delta variant was highly infectious and dominated the world very quickly. And uh, it, it, it's estimated that 78, 80% of those in household contacts would develop disease within five days. And as we all know, 80 to 85% of all uh, infections are contracted in family clusters. Now came along the Delta variant, or the uh, Omicron variant. And rather than just a few, 10 to 12 uh, uh, mutations, which all the other variants had, this one had 50 variations mutations in it and 36 within the spike protein. And this is the spike protein. Each one of these red circles is actually a, a mutation. And I'll go into those a little bit more. And it turns out that it's two to three times more efficient spread as compared to the Delta with a reproductive rate of 10 to 16. Now let's look at, this is a nice scheme. Uh, it came from the Washington Post, uh, Bonnie Burgers and Aaron Streckelberg uh, really showed uh, where these uh, mutations are, were, are in the various uh, variants. And you can see the alpha had a few uh, mutations and the antigen recognition site a few in the ACE2, one in the ACE2 binding domain, uh, while the beta has three in the ACE2 binding domain as the, the gamma, and the delta just had two, but they were very uh, effective uh, uh, variations. But look at the binding domain in the Omicron. Virtually only one amino acid is spared. They're all mutated. And similarly, the furin cleavage site has many more uh, mutations in it than the other variants. And you'll, we'll talk about the antigenic site. This is the end terminal of the uh, spike protein, which is where the antibodies and cell mediated uh, immune cells uh, actually recognize the spike protein. And you see there are a lot more uh, variations there as well. So what happens with the Omicron variant? It binds uh, far more strongly even than the Delta, the ACE2 receptors. It enters and grows in cells more rapidly estimated is 70% uh, more rapidly than the Delta. And viral assembly and vesicle formation is 7,000 times higher than the, the original type. So you could, the cell could produce up to 70,000 viral particles, a single cell. This is just unheard of, the amount of viral reproduction and really virtually using all of the cell's machinery to produce this virus. And here is the reproductive rate just to show schematically how many people one individual can, can infect on average 10 to 16. Uh, and it's estimated 90 to 100% of household contacts will become infected within five days. So uh, the Omicron, uh, a fair amount of, of individuals are pre-symptomatic and uh, the uh, incubation period is shorter rather than four to five days. The Delta was a little bit shorter, but this is even more uh, brief. 1.5 to three days after uh, contact with somebody infected. And the problem is the aerosol is uh, and droplets are 7,000 times higher, uh, explaining its highly infectious uh, nature. And uh, we've talked about this many times. And originally in the early uh, original virus, it seemed that droplets were more important. But as the, uh, the uh, spike proteins become more positive in its charge, um, what the thought is that the uh, positive charge attracts proteins from the respiratory tract, particularly mucin. And when it attracts mucin, which is negatively charged, it coats the viral particles and protects them from oxidation. This allows aerosol to be much more highly infectious in small and small particles and small and remain in the air for prolonged periods of time. So as we've moved 
from the original strain to the Omicron, aerosol has become an increasingly important pathway. And I think at this point is the major pathway by which this virus spreads. And what does that mean? That means that now cloth masks are virtually useless. Surgical masks are fair, but really an N95 or its equivalent uh, with very tight fitting um, is very, very important for protection against this virus. And this is a graph that uh, it was published in the, Washington, uh, the Wall Street Journal, I think shows uh, this is the duration of time on the, on the uh, left axis here is persons infected uh, and what they're wearing and the person uninfected what they're wearing. If both people are not wearing any mask, the average time in a closed space to become infected is 15 minutes. If uh, the uninfected person is wearing cloth minutes, that lengthens at 20 minutes, a surgical mask of 30, N95 to 2.5 hours. Uh, if you are, are, if that person is wearing a cloth mask, uh, you see you don't get much improvement. If you, uh, if the, you get 27 minutes, the surgical, if both people are wearing surgical masks, you get the 40 minutes. But if ever both people are wearing an N95 mask, 25 hours you're protected. So it's really a huge difference uh, wearing an N95 mask. And that's why that's being emphasized in the hospital now. And another key thing when we're talking about aerosol is the size of the room. And that's why, you know, I'm, I'm really afraid of all small rooms right now. And I think we all should be a minimum number of people in a small room, because if one of those individuals is infected, it's highly likely everyone else in that room will be. Um, so outdoors is the, the best, um, a large room that's uh, extensively ventilated. And you want, uh, average is three volumes per hour, but you probably want six to eight volumes exchange of air uh, per hour, uh, given these, these problems with aerosol. Now, the big issue has been the vaccine. You've heard a lot about this. Uh, and the original uh, 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 vaccines, are, they all, all were directed against the spike protein. And what they do, the antibodies actually bind and, and cover the spike protein and prevent it from uh, binding to the ACE2 receptors. And uh, here are, are the variants of interest. Uh, just to review uh, quickly, all of them. So the wild type you can see has a reproductive rate of two to 2.7, the alpha variant three to five, the beta variant also, uh, which is really not, we aren't seeing anymore. And the gamma variant, which we aren't seeing anymore, they had similar reproductive rates to the alpha, but then the Delta became dominant because it has a reproductive rate of five uh, to uh, eight and uh, as marked if uh, enhanced the binding affinity to the ACE2 receptor and furin cleavage. And the Omicron is the king of them all with a reproductive rate of 10 to 16 with a markedly increased binding to the ACE2 receptor and the furin cleavage site. And then uh, the question of the, as I mentioned, the antigen recognition sites are, are really uh, a lot of uh, mutations in that site, which predicted that the vaccine was, would not be as effective. And indeed, that is the case in some preliminary data. And this is from the Imperial College in London. Um, here, here is the vaccine effectiveness on the vertical axis. Uh, this is the dose, uh, and dose and duration of time that that dose was given, uh, or actually this is age groups. And what you see is that uh, the, uh, the Delta variant, there's a little drop off as you get older and as the dose is for a more prolonged period. Uh, you drop down to 40 from 80% to about 40%. Uh, however, when you get to the Omicron, uh, this is zero. So basically, uh, there is very little in the way of protection um, to the, the Omicron without a booster. If you get the booster, you move up to 75%. So two doses after five months, uh, approximately 0% uh, protection uh, with the, uh, the booster you get 75% protection against infection. And uh, when it comes to uh, the, uh, that's, excuse me, that's the J&J uh, &J and AstraZeneca. Um, when it comes to the Pfizer and Moderna, we're a little better off. And that uh, uh, if this is actually, this is the duration in weeks after the second booster. What you see is the Delta drops off a little over time. The Omicron drops down 40, 33, so about 30, 33% 30, 
uh, with two doses. And then if you get the booster, you're up to 75%. It's interesting that having two doses of the Pfizer and Moderna protects you 70% from hospitalizations. If you get the booster, it's virtually 100% protection. So uh, what about testing, isol uh, testing isolation of the newly infected? Uh, as we've talked about all of the different viral strains, 20 to 40% uh, are asymptomatic. And it may be even higher in those that are exposed and carrying the virus that have been vaccinated. Uh, and the CDC now recommends because of the highly infectious nature of this virus, they've looked at when you're infectious and it's the first five days, 70% of infections are transmitted during that time. So a 20 to 30% after that period. So they have done a risk benefit ratio and felt that five days is how long someone should isolate uh, if they're asymptomatic and, or if symptoms have improved. And uh, they are keep changing, but uh, as of now, if you were um, at five days, they do recommend an antigen test to make sure that you're uh, cleared. If the antigen test is positive five, after five days, then you should uh, rem um, remain isolated or quarantined for five more days. And uh, so, and, and during this entire time, what they're doing is they're assuming you're gonna mask if you come back after five days. And if you use an N95, that should reduce the risk of infection to a very, very low level and allow people to work after their symptoms have resolved. Now there's a tremendous debate about this. I think they made the right choice, but there is some debate. Uh, some people want it to be 100% uh, secure and safe. And I don't think that's possible with the Omicron. So uh, just to recall, um, you want to use the antigen test, which comes up uh, quickly. Here's the time, uh, time, time of exposure. Uh, at, it takes about two to three days, actually, for the Omicron. Uh, and then the antigen, the antigen does correlate very closely with live culture, while the PCR, as we know, persists for a prolonged period. So you can't use PCR to decide when someone should uh, be uh, uh, stop isolating and stop quarantining. It has to be an antigen test. Now, there are some problems with the antigen test in that uh, the, uh, it may miss uh, early on uh, the Omicron. But one thing about the PCR is, as you may recall, they use usually three probes for the PCR, one usually against the nuclear capsid, uh, maybe uh, one or against the membranes uh, encoding, and one, the spike protein. It turns out that the Fisher PCR, the spike protein that they have selected, um, is actually mutated in the Omicron. So what happens is you get um, the uh, RNA nuclear capsid signal is good, the membrane signal is good, but the S signal is, is defective. And that actually is a specific test and correlates very well with genomic sequencing, indicating that you're dealing with the Omicron. Now, at this point in the in Florida, 95% of cases are Omicron, so I'm not sure we have to worry about that anymore. And so then the antigen test, there's a little bit of debate about the antigen test right now. I can't say for sure. The sensitivity may be lower for the Omicron, but uh, we're waiting for more formal tests. But it's still, it's, it's, it, the, all of the antigen tests are actually against the nuclear proteins and not the spike protein. And therefore there's reason to believe that all of them will work reasonably well. Now, another uh, method for deciding whether or not you become infected, and uh, I've submitted this to uh, Lancet Infectious Disease, is to follow your temperature. It turns out if you follow your temperature uh, greater than 72, hour, three, 72 hours, in other words, each day, each morning, and uh, you will detect a fever 73% uh, of the time in associating with the onset of, of, of COVID-19. So it's a very good early marker. And actually the sensitivity is equivalent to uh, antigen test. So it's a very quick way of, of determining the, whether you have developed the disease. And actually there was one group in Boston where Boston healthcare workers monitored, they got an 85% sensitivity. Um, if you combine this with symptoms, um, and we did a logistic regression analysis, 
um, you actually get a, a, the bit to be more specific. The specificity is only 70% for fever alone. But if you have fever and chills, you increase the odds ratio by 3.5. If you have loss of taste and smell, it goes up to 10.3. Uh, cough, 3.5. Trouble breathing, 4.2. Fatigue seems to be very prominent. So if you have fever and fatigue, you almost don't need to do a test. You have COVID-19. And also diarrhea, uh, which is very prominent in Omicron. It's rare in, in the other, in the Delta. But if you have diarrhea and fever, that also is highly likely that you have COVID-19. And actually, we, I have a little algorithm of how you can actually determine whether what you should do under each of these circumstances. Whether you have fever, whether you have symptoms, uh, you can decide when and when and when you need to do a test and when you don't need to do a test, because as you know, these tests are hard to come by. So what you really want to do is no one intervention is going to do it. Uh, vaccination is the, probably the most helpful, but you want to be in, uh, avoid crowded environments. You want uh, places that with good ventilation and you really want to wear masks. And testing may be somewhat helpful. I think fever monitoring is probably the most helpful. Now, what's going to happen in Florida? And this is just, Ira Longini just updated this. Uh, this is a, a a simulation of what uh, he's predicting will happen, knowing the reproductive rate, knowing the uh, degree of severity of disease uh, he and, and the test positivity so far. He's uh, predicting, and these are the predictions from the past, which actually overlay very nicely. Uh, it, he predicts that by mid-January, so coming up in one more week, we will have uh, in Florida 90,000 positive tests per day. And it's going to come down, he predicts very quickly till February, new cases were going to drop way off by the beginning of February. Now deaths are going to be delayed. He didn't show that delay, but they're going to be delayed by about three, three to four weeks. So we would predict that deaths would peak probably in uh, mid February. Uh, and he's predicting right now 400 deaths per day at the peak. Now, what does that mean as far as the health system? Uh, if you have 400 deaths per day, and he's had estimates as high as 600 per day, we assume uh, it's roughly 20% of those with uh, COVID-19 in the past who were in the MI, uh, hospitalized in the MICU died. So that would uh, translate to, if for 400 deaths, that would be equivalent to 2,000 MICU patients per day. Now, the average length of stay in the MICU is 10 days. So if we have 400 deaths per day with throughout the state of Florida, that would be an estimate of 20,000 MICU beds would be occupied per day. Now, unfortunately, we only have 6,195 MICU beds in Florida. That means that if this scenario is true, we will exceed MICU beds by greater than threefold. So uh, the, um, there may be hell to pay by mid-February. Now, lo you're looking at the activity, I just wanted to show you one map and the map is continued on. This was from uh, actually 1227. Uh, uh, and just to show you in the past with the Delta variant, we were talking about peaks of 125 per 100,000. What we're seeing now is, uh, this was in, in this, uh, December 27th, we had in Miami, 276 per 100,000. And actually, I, as of today, it was 476 per 100,000. New York is up in the 450 range and other cities are in the 400 per 100,000. Alachua County, as of yesterday, has 201 per 100,000. This is three times what we've ever seen before. And we're much higher than the surrounding counties Marion County has 122 per 100,000. So the activity is extremely high. And here is the curve for Florida as of yesterday. And you can see that steep curve is persisting. And we're up now to 58,216 per day. So we're, we're moving toward that 90,000 peak that uh, the EPI has predicted. And here are the hospitalizations. And uh, in late December, we had about five, uh, on one four, we had 5,000 cases 
uh, hospitalized. We're now up to 8,641 per day in the state of Florida. Look at the deaths, still very, very low, but uh, that's gonna change dramatically in about two to three weeks. So to conclude uh, about Omicron itself, it's one of the most infectious agents ever reported, more rapid growth in cells and higher concentration of saliva and sputum than any variant before it. It's transmitted predominantly by aerosol. So air filtration and ventilation would be critical. N95 or K95 masks are gonna be very important. Uh, screaming with rapid antigen or daily temperature plus symptom review are good ways to detect whether or not you've got the virus. Isolation five days away from others, quarantine without vaccine, five days at home. Um, and you, uh, the healthcare workers, they keep changing the rules. And I think that uh, uh, Dr. Iovine is, is going to have to decide on those. Uh, it's very complicated to tell you the truth. Uh, it's very complicated. Full vaccine vaccination now is three shots. Two shots will give you a protection against hospitalization, but not from symptomatic disease. And uh, with the present COVID friendly policies in Florida, the Florida health systems may become overwhelmed in mid late to late floor, uh, February. Now, what about the clinical manifestations and treatment of the variant? Well, we talked about uh, symptoms and the symptoms are a little bit different in Omicron. Uh, the loss of taste and smell has not been reported or much far less. There seems to be a predominance of nausea, vomiting and diarrhea and fatigue is a major symptom. And so those are things to look out for among our patients with Omicron. And uh, when evaluate them, the NEWS2 score, and I'll show you the evaluation of some of the, our patients. I just did an evaluation of uh, 10 of our patients that are in the hospital today. But uh, this uh, is when you have a score of six or greater, uh, they are at increased risk for deterioration and it's far better than CURB-65 or SOFA. And the MD-Calc has this. It, you measure the respiratory rate, the oxygen saturation, whether or not they're on oxygen, uh, the, the fee, degree of fever, blood pressure, pulse, and whether they're alert. And if you're uh, six or above, uh, expect deterioration. So as far as other lab data to evaluate, um, really the minimum we found when we worked, uh, Gautam uh, Kalyatan and I worked in India, and we found that really we were able to manage these patients very well with a total white count, a differential, and an absolute uh, lymphocyte count, a creatinine, sodium, potassium, AST, ALT, and bilirubin, a CRP, a D-dimer, and a digital chest x-ray or CT scan, if you can get it. And if the conditions are, or clinical conditions are more severe, and you're thinking about bacteria, you may use a procalcitonin. Ferritin, honestly, I have not found that to be useful. It comes up slowly, and it, in some cases, it's very high, but it doesn't help me in management. Now, uh, what happened with the previous uh, viruses is that the pre high percentage of patients were mild to moderate, and they were at low risk of going to de developing a fatal outcome. And then a lower percentage are severe to critical and those patients are at higher risk for death. And uh, the Delta variant, the incubation period was two to three days uh, versus the uh, previous uh, variants was four to five. And for about 40% were at mild disease, 40% uh, moderate disease, 15% severe, and 5% and, uh, critical. And that progressed more quickly. The other variants was day 12, but it progressed in Delta uh, by day seven. Now, so mild disease is defined as the various signs and symptoms of COVID-19 uh, do not have shortness of breath or, or dip, dyspnea and don't have an abnormal chest X-ray. Modern illness shows evidence of lower respiratory tract disease with a positive chest X-ray, but an O2 saturation of greater than 94% on room air. Severe disease, uh, the uh, O2 sat of less than 94% on room air uh, and uh, requiring oxygen and in critical disease, a respiratory failure, um, either um, high flow oxygen or mechanical ventilation and septic shock. So what do we know about the illness severity for the Omicron? Um, the more rapid growth in the bronchial epithelial cells, so that increases the concentration of the saliva and the sputum. Uh, there seems to be in, in now six animal or in vivo studies, 
of uh, tissue culture cells in animals, there appears to be a lower grade, growth rate in pulmonary alveolar cells. So decreased pneumonia. And uh, in Europe uh, and South Africa, it seems that the rate of hospitalization is 35% lower and the rate of placement in the MICU is 20% lower. So, uh, and thinking about this from the standpoint of percentages of, of disease, uh, the incubation period is very rapid. Uh, day zero, uh, mild, mild case are gonna persist in 80% approximately, moderate disease approximately 15%, severe 4%, and critical one to two percent. The problem is the number of cases and the uh, cases of individuals infected is so much higher that this still is going to seriously impact our health system, as our, the uh, EPI uh, simulation showed. Now, I just to get an idea of what we're dealing with right now, I actually did a random, chose ten out of the fifty-three cases that are in the hospital right now in the hospital service. And uh, what I did is I, I have a, we used a little Excel chart that was very helpful in discussing cases um, in, um, in India. And it's just the age, whether or not they're vaccinated, days to first symptom, uh, major symptoms, underlying disease, O2 sat, a respiratory rate, and news 2 score, which we found to be very, very helpful. The total white count, the lymphocyte count, the serum creatinine, the CRP, D-dimer, procalcitonin, and, uh, and, they, and then the chest, in, in India, they use a CT score, but I just, uh, whether they have pneumonia or not. And then you can break it down is mild, moderate, severe, and then the plan for each of the individual cases. And what I found when I analyzed these 10 cases uh, randomly selected, six out of the 10 were mild. That is uh, no significant hypoxia whatsoever, but just some of the symptoms and signs of COVID. Three had moderate disease and only one had severe. And that's actually this particular case, uh, which has a news two score of seven. And that particular patient is the one that needed high flow oxygen. Five of the patients that were admitted had news two scores of zero. And the vaccine status, seven were unvaccinated, including the severe case, and three were vaccinated, and then they tended to have mild disease. Chest x-ray findings, there were only three out of the 10 that had infiltrates. And this is really scary. And we've got to really be careful that two out of the 10 contracted the infection in the hospital. In other words, they had a negative PCR when they came in and three, day, three to four days later, they turned up with a positive PCR. And five were admitted primarily for other problems. Um, so that uh, this is uh, a major issue is that uh, the actual infection is mild, uh, but they're here for other problems. For example, a patient had cellulitis the face um, because he kept uh, had a little furuncle that he uh, that he manipulated, and uh, he would turn out to also have uh, positive PCR, but the symptoms were mild and he didn't require any treatment for that. So uh, as far as treatment protocols, so how do we change the treatment protocols? Well, you remember with Delta, we want to be very careful of fluid management and IV hydration should be avoided because of the risk of ARDS. I think if there's no infiltrate on chest x-ray, you can be a little bit more liberal with your IV fluids since diarrhea is a, prior, is a major problem in some of these patients. And we had one patient with adrenal insufficiency who presented with syncope as a consequence of the diarrhea and the COVID-19. Uh, I think you can follow the urine output, the creatinine, look for JVD, uh, but I think you probably can be a little more liberal, and certainly if they have nausea and vomiting, you can't really uh, hydrate them orally. Anticoagulation in all patients, but um, the D-dimer was only elevated in two patients, and the height was 1.0 in both of those. So D-dimer does not seem to be as high so far in the few cases that I've reviewed Antibiotics, as we talked about, are not necessary. Uh, uh, secondary bacterial and fungal infections are very late in the game. And treatment will depend uh, really on the duration of symptoms. Um, so as a, as a surrogate marker, uh, CRP and lymphocyte count, news two are, are helpful. Uh, for instance, uh, one, one patient, uh, an elderly patient, had a very high CRP 
And they actually also, you can do, uh, if you have available, IL-6 level was 400 in that patient. And they decided just based on that, even though she only had uh, no, a very faint infiltrate and needed two liters of oxygen, they actually started dexamethasone in her because of the high uh, news, uh, the high uh, CRP and the high IL-6 IL levels. So I think the news too, and the CRP and the D-dimer and lymphocyte count can predict hospital course. Uh, and nasal, you want obviously we know maintain the O2 saturations above 92 percent. Um, so far, the BiPAP has not been needed. Uh, our experience in India was very poor with BiPAP. Um, I really don't like that. I think high flow, high flow uh, nasal oxygen does work very well, and that would be the preferred treatment. Um, and uh, it gives a significant amount of PEEP and reduces, and there's actually a study very recently that shows a reduction in the JAMA, a reduction in the need for intubation of about 30, 35% if you use uh, high flow oxygen. Now, remdesivir, we all know about remdesivir and it does shorten the hospital stay. It does reduce mortality uh, when the ACT2 was uh, ACT Act one NIH trial was finally uh, fully uh, analyzed. It reduces mortality from 11.6 to 6.7%. And there was actually an analysis by uh, one of our investigators, EPI, uh, uh, who uh, in clinical infectious disease, looking at the, uh, he's a mathematician, he looked at the progression of disease and those that received remdesivir and those that did not. And he found that remdesivir actually stops the progression, but does not reverse injury. So what that means is if you want to stop the disease from progressing, the earlier you can give remdesivir, the better. So remdesivir uh, uh, for COVID-19 positive test with uh, oxygen level uh, uh, O2 sat of under 94% on room air. And the question is whether uh, there are other Omicron, uh, other uh, indications of Omicron since fewer are, have a low O2 sat. And I think with a high... Uh, um, CRP uh, with the, uh, if there was a high D-dimer, um, if the patient is immunocompromised, if the lymphocyte count, in my view, if the lymphocyte count drops below uh, 0.8, I think I would worry and consider using remdesivir. Um, and I would have a low threshold for remdesivir. And I know we're trying to use a three-day course and that's where we're hoping we can get home IV therapy uh, for these patients in the future. And where I'm working with Gautam on that right now. Uh, the duration of symptoms has to be less than 10 days, preferably within the first uh, five days. Um, and uh, the ALT, if it's uh, greater than 10 times uh, the normal, uh, is a cutoff. I haven't found that to be ha happen very often at all. And the dose, you know, is 200 milligrams the day one, followed by 100 milligrams uh, for five days. And we have been using an abbreviated course if they don't have hypoxia and they aren't significantly immunocompromised. Uh, dexamethasone, uh, actually only uh, one, uh, actually two patients of the 10 required dexamethasone. Um, if the CRP is high, uh, if they're uh, hypoxic is the, and, and in the, with the Delta and the alpha variants and the wild type of virus, um, there seemed to be, it was only a benefit when there was hypoxia. And so for the most part, I think that's the setting that we should be using it. And, uh, and then the IL-6 inhibitors, telisimab, cerulimab, um, uh, there is now studies that show that it improves survival by 1.6 fold, and it should be used. Uh, and this it doesn't look too, it, uh, the, the studies aren't huge, but they do show uh, benefit. And then I, I actually put this out of order, but uh, you, you patients are still demanding ivermectin. And here is a really nice study in BMC infectious disease. It's the best study uh, where they actually looked at uh, approximately 250 placebo, 200, uh, 250 ivermectin, and the two uh, curves as far as uh, need for intubation, of ventilatory support are superimposable. And they actually found that those with ivermectin uh, went on ventilatory support earlier than those that were not receiving ivermectin. So you can quote this, if somebody demands ivermectin, say, well, that's great. Yeah, you're, you'll put your loved one on a ventilator more readily if they give this drug. And I'm sorry, I can't do it. Um, here, sorry, is the IL-6 inhibitors. 
And you can see there is a significant difference uh, when the IL, IL-6 reduces the, uh, improves the likelihood of survival uh, significantly. Um, so the indication for tulizumab, uh, obviously you have to have a COVID positive test. They should be already receiving dexamethasone for at least 24 hours and not be improving with progressive uh, respiratory failure uh, defined as escalation from a nasal O2 to high flow oxygen, uh, increasing the amount, number of liters in the O2 sat, need for BiPAP, CPAP, or mechanical ventilation, evidence of inflammation, the CRP should be greater than or equal to 75 uh, to consider it, and hospitalization should be less than seven days. And that uh, this Dr. is- Dr. Southwick, yes. I, st I think the Shan's uh, protocol for the hospitalization is three days, and I don't know, like, is that, does that make any sense? Three days, to, uh, the shortest, uh, for when you can use trilisumab? Like if the patient on day four, pharmacy refuse it. That's not what the, I'll have to look. The, that's not what the IDSA guidelines were. And, and that's actually on the order set on EPIC. If you go and okay. try to order to trilisumab, it, wow. it, that's it, a it, really that's, small as order. As far as I remember, I don't know if somebody can correct me if that's wrong. Okay, well, that's good to know. I didn't know that because um, the magic number was five days in the past, but or actually hospitalization less than seven days was what the studies show. But uh, maybe because there's such a shortage. Yeah. I know maybe. we've I had figured. a shortage. That's probably why. That's probably why. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. And this is the dose. Good. Thank you for uh, checking on that. Um, you know, one group that I think is important uh, case by day is, is, is pregnancy and pediatric cases, um, whether it should be used there. Now, whether it's going to be needed in, in Omicron, I don't know. So far, I haven't seen any cases where this would be indicated. So, um, and then I've already showed you this little graphic, which really helps in, you can follow the patients. Uh, for instance, th th this is a patient from India and uh, originally their news two score was six. They were at a respiratory rate of 40 per minute. Their O2 sat was 79 to 84 on room air. Uh, they had to switch to high flow oxygen and uh, their respiratory rate was still 29 per minute. Uh, and they, uh, they, they, what we did because they were uh, required high flow oxygen, we added, we had already treated with remdesivir, dexamethasone and heparin, and we added trilisumab because of the uh, ne increased need for oxygen. And uh, that was actually day since first sep, we did a day, that was day eight of symptoms. And actually, we got uh, we got some very significant improvement and reductions in need for oxygen over about two days, with a drop in the CRP from 139 to 72 very quickly. So I, I'm really surprised at the three days, and I think that's probably the limited supply. Baricitinib, uh, the JAK2 inhibitors, uh, work in a similar way to the IL-6, but block more of the cytokines. IL-1, IL-10, in addition to IL-6, TNF interferon gamma and GM, GM CF, CF. So it would make sense that this might be a more powerful if a patient's deteriorating. And there is one study uh, in the New England Journal which, uh, which compared baricitinib to placebo, or baricitinib and remdesivir to placebo and remdesivir. This is the ACT2, which you're familiar with, and did show a dramatic uh, Im improvement uh, in the uh, portion of patients that recovered. And there uh, is also a study from Brazil. Uh, this is in the New England Journal, uh, which showed that the reduced mortality in those that were, most of these patients were already on corticosteroids. Uh, and they used a different JAK2 inhibitor called tofacinib, uh, but it's really similar to baricitinib. And they dropped the mortality from 29 to 18.1%. So if you've got a severely ill patient, that's not improving and they're really deteriorating fast, you could consider baricitinab as well. And then uh, what's gonna happen soon, unfortunately, I think it's gonna come out after this surge is over, um, is this new uh, protease inhibitor combined with a retonavir. And it, it is uh, from uh, Pfizer, and it will reduce the risk of hospitalization and death by 89% compared to placebo. Now, if anybody that's worked with ritonavir 
on HIV knows that this drug uh, blocks the cytochrome P450 system, and therefore it's going. There's a major issue of drug drug interactions. Through three of the biggest drugs that it affects uh, profoundly are Lipitor, OxyContin, and Zoloft. But if if this does come, become available, it's important to check for drug drug interactions. But if we could get this, we could get send people home on this early on if they were individuals that were an increased risk for serious disease. So to summarize uh, treatment, monitoring illness severity and cytokine markers, supportive therapy with oxygen, cautious IV fluids uh, and oral fluids when possible. Remdesivir should be given as early as possible. In fact, as soon as they arrive, uh, dexamethasone for those that are hypoxic, whether it should be used in other indications for those with Omicron, I think is open to interpretation. And then the IL-6 inhibitors and uh, the, uh, the JAK-2 inhibitors for more severely ill patients. And I, it's not clear with, will, that will be required. And then whether this particular variant causes a hypercoagulable state is open to question. I should point out that among uh, the patients that uh, we looked at, uh, they were only two that had an elevated D-dimer and it was one. So I didn't see any at four to five. So there's some question whether we will, uh, certainly uh, prophylaxis is indicated at this point, whether we're gonna need anything else, I don't know. With that, I'll stop and entertain any questions. Dr. Desauth, a quick question. Yes. Since this, this is a, not a predominantly pulmonary involvement, as you mentioned, Yes. What has been the experience of South Africa and UK? Because we are a little bit into the late into this game. So um, there are, any studies from them? No, they, they're, there are some small studies and, and that's what they're finding. Exactly. I think what the 10 cases I randomly selected uh, reflected pretty much the descriptions that they had. Uh, patients, the disease was milder. Uh, what they noticed is when they went on the wards pri in the prior uh, uh, surges, there were oxygen flowing everywhere and oxygen noise and high flow oxygen, none of that. Very few patients needed oxygen. Very few had abnormal chest x-rays. And it was more these other underlying diseases that were precipitated uh, by, the, by the Omicron that it led to the admission to the hospital. So I, I think what we're seeing is true now is, is gonna be reflected, the problem is the volume of cases we are gonna have, particularly in Florida because of the, uh, the really uh, preventing uh, the use of masks and mandate and not pushing the vaccine uh, is gonna be, there's gonna be a greater surge here. And therefore there is reason to believe that there will be more. We had one out of 10 that had significant respiratory compromise that required high flow oxygen. But it, what the Omicron, it doesn't, it, it can infect the lung, but it's less likely. But uh, if it does infect the lung, then it could look like, it can look like Delta. And so that one case out of 10 that we saw um, was looking a lot like Delta. Now it's Since still the, so possible, it might, that might've been a Delta. We don't know that for sure. Yeah, that's why this is the part two of the question was since Delta has not disappeared and we are very- That's right. State, we can't know so that. Yeah, we don't know that. It's about 95%, but so we can't be sure. There are some comments in the chat about the order um, for, as you mentioned about the TOSI and it said, and if I put it in there, less than or equal to three days prior to the order, including time at outside hospital, and that they prefer you use it within 72 hours of admission, but not a hard and fast rule, exceptions can be made. Okay. Yeah, that's really early. I, I don't know how many of our patients will actually ever fall into that, that category, but maybe. That means you got to decide uh, right up front when they're admitted whether or not they're going to need tolisumab or baricitinib. Yeah. Um, about the VTE X, uh, treatment, the hematology started a little thread, and our representatives are Ryde and Riley. And so they're trying, we're trying to get a consensus of some new guidelines came out 
very consistent with what you presented about using the D-dimer to decide for non-critically ill, that is for patients, about using therapeutic anticoagulation. So hopefully once there's consensus, um, we'll update those algorithms and we can ask Riley to give us an update. Yeah, that'd be good, Riley. You keep If you can keep track of that, uh, that would be very, very helpful. And then the other thing that uh, Umar and Riley and Kelly and I have started a dialogue and is deciding uh, what are the criteria for admission? You know, the, the criteria for admission were much easier before. You just O2 sat under, you know, room air, 92% or lower, and they got admitted. Now, since a lot of these patients are not uh, requiring oxygen, how do, how do we decide who's admitted? And I, 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 I'm not sure what those criteria should be yet. And I, I think we're going to have to have a dialogue about that. Now, if we could have home care, uh, a home care option, this would be huge. Right now, we don't have that home care option, but I think all of, everybody keep thinking and, and uh, you know, over the next two or three days, I think uh, Umar and, and Kelly and, and Riley, we should come up with a rough guess of what we think would be, make most sense to start. I think that would be good. So Brandon Allen had sent out that ED COVID playbook revisions pending. So probably best to loop him in because I think that they're updated. Okay, more. yeah, well, well, yeah, we, we should definitely copy him and that, yeah, because because they're the ones that are going to decide on the mission, and then we got to, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I, and then the other question is, it looks like a lot of these patients, if they're, you know, got a little dehydration or they have a little, their underlying disease gotten a little worse, like they're, you could be, there are patients with uh, their blood sugar can get out of control, could get a little congestive heart failure. What happens, their underlying diseases are the stress of the Omicron is setting off their disease. If we can correct that quickly, we should be able to discharge these patients fairly, you know, in, in short order. So I think that's going to be really important to discharge as quickly as possible so we don't get overwhelmed with cases because they seem to be coming in pretty fast right now. So I wanted to ask you about your analysis. That was very interesting. So did you think that the patients, because most of their news too was low, maybe didn't need to come in or that they can be quick discharge? Um, the, a lot of them uh, were, um, they had other things. They had cellulitis. Um, there was uh, a one, one, oh, they had one's, uh, was a patient. Oh, well, two of them, two of the ones are zero got it in the hospital. Yes. So you really, what, one of them, the father visited him. He, this is a patient with leukemia. His father visited him and had a little cold and gave it to him. The other patient is a patient that had Legionnaire's pneumonia and then got COVID after the Legionnaire's in the hospital. So mm -hmm. while we've got to be so cautious using N95 masks uh, because it's clearly being spread uh, from to our patients. I mean, if two out of 10, and that was just a random selection, that tells you this thing is really, really infectious. And I, I really recommend everybody, I take my temperature every morning, just like clockwork. And uh, well, I know that my temperature, my average temperature is about 97.8 to 98.2. So if I got a deviation of 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a fever or one degree centigrade, that's a fever. And uh, then you should uh, look, you know, sort of think about, well, is that headache, is this new? Or, or if you get some of the other specific symptoms, then you you can be pretty sure you've got it and you shouldn't come in. That's a quick, quick question. Since we are a COVID friendly state and we don't know who's vaccinated, who's not unvaccinated, don't we should screen the patient in the ED who are already vaccinated versus not vaccinated? They may be purely a Delta virus case. We just start thinking about is, is, is this guy is unvaccinated, he's likely going to run a more difficult and more prolonged course. Why not this guy is admission criteria compared to guy who's already vaccinated? Discharge. Yeah, uh, I'm vaccinated. I'm, of, of, the, of the cases, I, I forgot to mention that seven of the cases of the 10 were unvaccinated. So we still um, have so, a big, and, big section of population which is unvaccinated, correct? Yeah, so it's they may be even having a Delta virus. Even with the Omicron, it's predominantly those that are hospitalized are, are unvaccinated. 
So I think it's real important to check right the vaccine vaccine status. One or two of the uh, admissions didn't mention the vaccine status, but most uh, to everybody's credit, majority did. They did a very good job of documenting. And two of the people, two of the three vaccinated had had the booster. So that was so if really you are doing with the ED, the admission criteria with AOD and ED, the, the person is vaccinated, we are fairly comfortable in discharging the patient. Yes, I, I would agree. I would agree. There's a good chance that they're going to do fine and you don't have to worry as much. Yes, that should be a part of the criteria. Umar, write that down. <laughs> He has in the chat, is there a way to know the difference between Omicron and Delta unless you check the s gene on the cycle threshold? Well, the problem is, I don't know if we have that Fisher PCR. Uh, see, the other PCRs use different probes. And because of supply problems, I think we've used five, or diff five different PCR sets of primers. So um, I don't know that we have that luxury. It would be really nice. For those that I would say those with more severe disease, if we could get if we could talk to pathology about getting that Fisher PCR, that would really help us. And a sort of curiosity: What is the Mickey MIC situation? Are they getting overwhelmed with the uh, infection? No. MIC. No, very few cases. They aren't. They aren't That's having them yet. You saw. See, we we only have twenty six deaths so far. So that tells you that severe disease is, is still uh, taking its time to show its ugly head. So Dr. Southwick, that a likely prediction model of MIQ getting overrun may or may not be? I hope it's wrong. Yeah, yeah that's I, what I'm thinking. I'm basing that on the MIQ. number of deaths he predicted. And that's a prediction, you know, and originally his original uh, prediction was 100 deaths peak, in which case we would get 80% of MICU beds uh, occupied. That was the original, but now he's gone to 400. I, you know, who knows that? I think the deaths is a lot harder to predict. And based on what I'm, what we're seeing so far, I, I haven't seen, you know, I don't, I, I'd be surprised if the mortality is going to be that high. I think we'll be more slammed on the general floors. Like, uh, yes, exactly. And that's why I think we want to get home care as quickly as we can. We want to get whatever underlying problems that were made worse, get those corrected quickly and get them out of the hospital as fast as possible so we don't get overwhelmed. And I think there's, because this is a milder disease, like the CRPs, most of the time, I only had one patient that had a high CRP, you know, really high in the 300 range. They were mostly 12, 15, 20, 2. So the CRPs are not high. So there's not a tremendous amount of inflammation, which is really good. And the one that had the CRP was unvaccinated. Yeah, the MICU has 12 patients, but many of those are incidental positive. They have other stuff going on. Yeah. Well, this was really, as always, very informative and detailed. Thank you for recording it for the people who couldn't make it. Um, I think the follow-up questions, I think Dr. Southwick, if you just check with ID about those, mainly the when we should be using the monoclonal, that's the one thing. And I'll reach out right. to the, at the lab to see if we have that um, S probe test. You're right, right, yeah. Yeah, one of the problems, I didn't include monoclonal because the majority of the monoclonal, like the Regeneron, doesn't work against Omicron. The only thing works is the Galaxo, and that one is in back back ordered, and there it's. I think they're releasing the other two that don't work for Omicron, which is not going to be much help, unfortunately. That's why I didn't mention the monoclonal. Yeah, that makes sense. Completely. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Class team, thank you everybody for joining, and those of you who have already signed up for shifts, I thank you. If you haven't had a chance to do that yet, please go into Humanity and do that. I think it's better that we be well prepared because we can. We just heard that the majority of patients will be the floor level patients. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, Bye everybody.